Thank you, David. It's an honor to be here. Uh, the Association for Recorded Sound Collections is close to my heart. And I, like many of you, have lived to see uh, unimaginable changes in how sound is handled, recorded, and reproduced. And that's part of what I'm talking about. And I'm honored to be on the panel with Roberta Schwartz and to hear her exciting paper tight like that. I want to acknowledge some old friends. Uh, Chris Strackwitz from our Hooli Records, my great hero, uh, one of the great leaders of this world of recorded sound, uh, Tony Seeger, uh, Mary Catherine Alden, with whom I had a visit this morning, Lance and April Ledbetter, who run Dust to Digital, and all of my field recordings are being packaged by their capable hands. Uh, I'm here really to talk about recorded sound that ended up in this book, Give My Poor Heart Ease, which are essentially sounds that were recorded in the 60s in the Mississippi uh, Delta and that are now in this book on CD and DVD. It's also a, an Amazon multimedia book with text embedded with sound and picture and soon to be released a uh, uh, hybrid theatrical musical work that's being executive produced by T-Bone Burnett. And we met yesterday with Colin Linden and Joe Henry, who are also working on that project. And with us today, Joe Bookshin, Kevin McCarthy, and Joseph Meagle are putting together a film and the theatrical rendering of all that. I want to dedicate my talk uh, to a dear friend, Greta Slobin, whom I just learned uh, died this week. Uh, she was an ethnomusicologist, and her husband, Mark Slobin, uh, were both very, very important in looking at uh, Yiddish folk music and a whole culture of recorded sound that they knew so much about. I had the pleasure of sitting in on the presentation of Joe Bahari and John Broven this morning and hearing sort of the generation before mine. Uh, growing up as a teenager in the 50s, I danced to and listened to the music that Joe recorded uh, on Randy's record shop at night and on jukeboxes. And these were, without my knowing, sort of the beginning of an education musically that led me to do the work that I later did as a folklorist and uh, a scholar in the field of folklore. And I'm going to talk about that journey today and carry you on a little sort of trip with me. Uh, the work in this book, Give My Poor Heart Ease, and really my life as a folklorist began on a, a farm in Mississippi with my first teachers who were people I grew up with. And they first carried me to a little church as a child where I learned the hymns and later realized that there were no hymnals. So when the singers and their families were no longer there, the music would be gone. And that ultimately led me to a career of trying to record and photograph and film those worlds. It was a journey that began without realizing where it was leading. So if we can, I don't know whether you dim the lights for PowerPoints, but let's go ahead and do that if that's possible. Uh, it was a trip up Highway 61 into the Mississippi Delta. And the destination really was where I started from on the farm. My first teachers uh, were people like Virginia Peel Davis, who ran a little uh, grocery store where on a summer afternoon I would get a Coke and a moon pie and listen to the stories. It's a place deeply rooted in history. Uh, for centuries, families have lived in that community, and those families became my family in deep ways as they taught me about the worlds in which I grew up. Robert Appleton, uh, the Russell sisters, two of five sisters who lived together, 
And at one point, one of them married and brought her husband home. And the first night, after the first night of their honeymoon, he left and never returned. So the Russell sisters lived together all their lives uh, as a family. And I became aware of those worlds in terms of seasons and how with each season the cycle of life changed. Uh, in the fall was the killing of pigs in which the community would gather together and share the work and share the meat that was produced. And I began to appreciate an African proverb that I often tell my students that when an old man or woman dies, a library burns to the ground. And the center of these worlds was the church, Rose Hill Church, which was originally built as a brush arbor church. During slavery, the limbs of trees were gathered together to create a little uh, shelter for worship, and that later became the church. And the families that gather there on the first Sunday are descendants of generations for over 200 years who've worshiped on that hill and are buried in it. And as a child, I became aware of how the church was a part of the family's lives from baptism to marriage to the final rites of death. Religion was a constant presence in everyone's life. And the final sort of burial at a funeral reminded me of the urgency of recording the work that we all in this room understand so well. Music and how with the passing of life, the sense of uh, the importance of this work uh, becomes even more uh, pressing. And I began to move beyond the church as a teenager and to record blues singers like Lovey Williams in the small community of Morning Star, Mississippi. up and down roads, you never knew who you would meet. Uh, and I would always pull out my tape recorder and camera and try to understand the people along the road like this evangelical uh, merchant of vegetables and fruit and his customers. And their lives were uh, invisible but very important and they are all captured in the work that I tried to create. The families that I stayed with and learned from included the Dotson family off of Highway 61 near Lorman, Mississippi, and they introduced me to one of the musical instruments in my work that I consider the uh, roots instruments of the blues, the one strand on the wall created from the wire of a broom handle. Mr. Dodson would stretch along the wall of his front porch and play. The one strand being a link with one strand instruments in Africa and the beginning of the bottleneck style guitar of Elmore James, whom we heard earlier this morning. Uh, these worlds beckoned. Hand-painted signs would lead me into little churches like this church in Bell Fountain, Mississippi, where the congregation still sing the Sacred Harp hymns, the earliest American hymnody that came from Boston 
into the deep south and is still sung in white and black congregations using all day sings and the rectangular hymnals. Uh, this music is especially important in communities like Bell Fountain. And here, Reverend Enox in the church is leading a hymn with a, a young girl about eight years of age joining him in the singing. Move forward about 20 years, and I was teaching at the University of Mississippi. Uh, she was a student in my graduate class on Southern music, studying Sacred Heart music. And in doing research in the library, to her amazement and mine, she discovered herself in this photograph. And today she's teaching Sacred Heart music and music at Rust College in Holly Springs, Mississippi. The circle is unbroken. And here are the shaped notes uh, in the Sacred Harp hymnals and the dinner on the grounds, the all day sing breaks at noon for the most amazing foods uh, that one can ever imagine. So the trip continued into the Mississippi Delta and along the way the homes of sharecroppers uh, with numbers on the outside appear to be a sort of anonymous dwelling world, but inside the deeply human links to the past through photographs of family and ancestors begin to connect to the true roots of the music. I visited and spent time in the most dreaded place in Mississippi, Parchman Penitentiary, the 28,000 acre penal farm in the heart of the Delta. And following in the footsteps of John and Alan Lomax recorded work chants uh, from prison inmates in Lambert, Mississippi in Camp B. This is the dreaded electric chair where many inmates were put to death. Leaving parchment and heading up into the hills of Mississippi, in Gravel Springs, I stayed with Oth Mr. and Mrs. Other Turner and learned about the history of that community where black families own their land and have a proud tradition of fife and drum music that dates back to the earliest memory of the families there. Drumming having been forbidden by slave uh, owners, plantation owners after the revolution led by Toussaint Louverture in Haiti, when drums were used to communicate with his people, uh, only a few communities still allowed and had drumming, and uh, Gravel Springs is one of them, considered the roots of blues. Uh, Other Turner was the patriarchal figure of that community and its music. And this picture of him with his granddaughter, uh, I especially love. Sadly, he died a few years ago in his 90s, but she is a young woman in her 20s who continues to play the fife and drum music. Uh, Mr. Turner showed me how to create a fife from cane that he cut from bamboo and how he would mark the holes and then burn with a piece of metal the holes in it to make the fife work. And every 4th of July in Gravel Springs, uh, the baseball team would host another team for a game after which they would congratulate each other and visit. And then the music would begin, the fife and drum music, the barbecue would be served, and a long day and evening would start.
The music would go into the wee hours of the evening. Continuing into the heart of Mississippi, uh, I was always reminded in the 60s of the Ku Klux Klan by their letters on road signs. And in black communities like Clarksdale, I followed in the footsteps of Joe Bahari. Uh, he mentioned his run-in with the police this morning, and I felt equally uncomfortable and stayed in the black communities. The legacy of Jim Crow was still clear in steps to an old hotel downtown that announced rooms for colored. Uh, I spent time at WROX radio station with Early Wright, the black DJ on the air there for over 40 years, who played both blues and gospel music. And at night, his mantra was, nighttime is the right time, the early right time. And on the streets, there was music uh, at every corner. If there is a crossroads in the Mississippi Delta, it must surely be Clarksdale, the home of Sam Cooke, of John Lee Hooker, of Ike Turner, of Muddy Waters. But for me, the home where I spent most time uh, was on Dempster Street with Jasper Love. And inside the photograph on the wall of Jasper and his brother Wade Willie Love on the wall uh, was made in 1942 in Daisy Studios, the studios of the Hooks family in Memphis. Benjamin Hooks, who was president of the NAACP, was part of that legacy. And I became a part of what I considered the blues family. Uh, who would gather every generation as Pine Top Johnson and Maudie Shirley would play and sing and others would dance and tell stories and enjoy the music which was a common bond in the community that sort of created a link to the past and a bridge to the future. These are the stories that drew me to the music. The music was uh, a way of surviving and enduring, and the stories of Jasper Love are especially rich. He told me how his grandparents arrived in Clarksdale uh, as, a as slaves on a steamboat and worked in the cotton fields all their lives. From Clarksdale, I moved to Leland, Mississippi, and worked with son Thomas. James Thomas and his uncle Joe Cooper took me into their neighborhood and introduced me to friends and to the uh, community bars and restaurants and explained to me that blues is what they called a deep study that takes a long time to understand and to play. And I discovered that Mr. Thomas was not only a gifted musician and storyteller, but also a sculptor who created faces and skulls and animals and birds out of delta clay, like this hepcat with its sunglasses. His wife is holding one of his birds, a quail. As a child, he was told that blacks were not allowed to hunt quail. They were only for whites to hunt. So he said, I'll make my own out of clay. This is a woman with a wig that he sculpted. His family, his children were constantly with him, watching his work as an artist. Today, all 13 children have a copy of the book. Several are in Chicago and others in Leland. When James Thomas arrived in Leland as a young man, he was taken in by the patriarchal figure of Leland, Shelby Papa Jazz Brown. And every Saturday night, he had a house party in the back room of his home in Kent's Alley where son Thomas would play and Papa Jazz would serve chitlins and corn liquor. <laughs> Thank you. 
In 1972, I moved to New Haven, Connecticut and began teaching at Yale University. And I lived as a resident fellow in Calhoun College, one of the 12 residential colleges. And each year, my friend James Thomas would come up for a few days to play and talk and share with students. He became an icon at Yale. Students recognized him and spoke to him as he walked around the campus. And because of his love for sculpture, we visited the Yale University Art Gallery's sculpture garden. And he was fascinated by those worlds and found inspiration there. And between his gigs, we would sit in the uh, guest suite in Calhoun College and talk about his memories of growing up in Mississippi and what it meant, meant to be a black child coming of age uh, in rural Mississippi. In the classroom, all ages came, not only the students at Yale, but uh, everyone from K through 12. One of the high school students was Tim Duffy, who later was inspired by James Thomas to create the Music Maker Foundation, which raises support for needy musicians. Among the students were students like Jeff Bukes, who is now the CEO of Time Warner, Gary Lucas, a gifted uh, guitar player who was just written up in the New York Times this past week. Uh, James Thomas touched and inspired students in profoundly important ways, and he demonstrated how you can take a lump of clay and create a face, then a skull, and animals from it. We also brought the king of the blues, B.B. King, who's long dreamed that the blues should be taught in the classroom. And my appointment was in Afro-American and American studies, and he spent time in African-American studies visiting with faculty and students. Here on the left with his chin in his hand is Charles Davis, my chairman, who was the first black tenured professor at Yale. With his back to the camera is John Blassingame, the great scholar uh, of slavery and the editor of Frederick Douglass's papers. Our students hung on every word of B.B.'s uh, narrative. One of my students, Joanne Braxton, on the right, uh, today is a distinguished professor uh, at the College of William and Mary and a poet whose daughter just graduated from Duke University. B.B. performed in Sprague Hall at Yale University to a standing room only crowd. And they absolutely adored every note he played. Thrill is gone. Thrill is gone away. We were able to get B.B. an honorary doctorate of humane letters at Yale in the 70s, and when the graduating class learned about it, they voted unanimously that he should be their baccalaureate speaker the day before. And his response to me was, Bill, I don't do talks. I'm not a speaker. And they replied, just bring Lucille, which he did. And the baccalaureate and the commencement were unforgettable moments for them and for all who love B.B. Uh, this is B.B. with Kingman Brewster, who was the president of Yale at that time. Uh, it was a very important moment affirming his life and leadership as a musician and a voice for the blues. We followed B.B into his penthouse uh, home on the west side of Central Park and talked with him about his childhood in the Mississippi Delta. My mother started me singing in church with her when I was about four. And then later on I started singing in a quartet. Uh, we would sing in church and the preacher, sanctified preacher, 
played guitar in church, uh, Sanctified Church. It was electric guitar. That was very exciting to me. Uh, so I finally bought a guitar. B.B. said that for him, he never had a family of parents that were part of a home. So today when he plays, and always when he plays before an audience, he looks at them as his family, and he sings in a deeply personal, connected way to his audience. To understand B.B.'s worlds, I followed him on the road, and in Boston, at Lucifer's place, uh, photographed and recorded him uh, in a concert there. And then uh, when he took a break after his first set, went backstage where he was signing and autographing albums and trying to get a, a brief break, uh, a few blinks of sleep. And I use this image as the cover to my book, Give My Poor Heart Ease. Uh, it was his way of getting a little ease if I would only stop clicking that camera, which I finally did. And then B goes back on stage in a new outfit for a second set. And today in his 80s, he's on the road for over 200 days of the year. Uh, as he says, nighttime is the right time. Uh, it's my life, it's the life I know. So from the earliest roots of that music in one strand and fife and drum, to the pinnacle of worlds like those of B.B. King, blues is a powerful voice for our nation uh, and for the whole concept of recorded sound. I think I've finished on time. Is that okay? Uh, so we can take questions and comments if you have them. Uh, That's kind of where I've been and where it all leads. Uh, in a way, this is, it's nice to live this long and see the ability to do things with recorded sound, which none of us could have imagined even five or 10 years ago. Chris Strackwitz. Well, I would just like to congratulate you on following up with us uh, <laughs> amateurs did when I had Paul Oliver first went to Mississippi, and, you know, I was in awe of what he was doing because to, to me he was the first person to actually document the lives of these people because he was sent by the BBC and I was enormously impressed by that. I was just a blues fan, I didn't really know what the hell I was doing. And, and I know that you finally carried on and took this whole culture back to them because it was changing rapidly. And uh, people were beginning to really put down the older styles, don't you think so? And, uh, yeah. And of course, they were extraordinarily poor. And, uh, but I'm, I'm really glad that she was one of the people who lived there and experienced it and felt that she should really take this back to where it came from. Thank you. Yes. Yes, it's not a question, but just like Chris, I want to plug you. Uh, the book is fabulous. Thank you. Uh, it's, I, I don't know how much time I spent with it between the CD and the DVD and the incredible pictures you have plus the text. Uh, it was one of my favorite books of last year. By the way, there are copies of the auction bid high, <laughs> and you should probably sign one to make it even more valuable. But, but congratulations. And this Thank you. There's wonderful films in the book. Oh, it's fabulous. Uh, it's just, it's Thank you. Yes. Yeah, in the communities that you visited uh, today, is there is the blues still exist uh, with the musical community there now? The question is, in those blue those communities I visited, is the blues still there? It is. Uh, James Thomas's son, Pat Thomas, continues to play and to do his father's sculpture. In the fife and drum community, Otha Turner's grandchildren and great-grandchildren continue to play. 
I was on the phone last week with his granddaughter, whose son is a student at the Mississippi School for the Arts and Sciences. He's a very fine student who's been admitted to the University of Mississippi, and they've had some trouble getting his scholarship lined up. So I've written the chancellor, and I'm trying to get that straight. But she, he wants to be a doctor, and I thought about the arc of that family from Other, who had no formal schooling, to his great-grandson, who will be a doctor, but who also plays in the fife and drum band. Uh, so the communities nurture and support this music, but one of my students who saw my book Blues from the Delta in San Francisco and was inspired to move to Clarksdale with her boyfriend uh, to look at and study the blues ended up doing her MA with me in folklore and is now doing a PhD in communications on not blues but hip hop. She wrote her thesis on hip hop music in Clarksdale and those hip hop singers all are comfortable with the blues and gospel but they're taking the music to the next step and she is now uh, in Africa in Senegal where she is studying Senegalese hip-hop singers. She's learned Wolof, comparing those with women singers in Clarksdale. So the global nature and the power of this music is beyond imagination. And the next generation of scholars, I mean, uh, Chris Strackwitz is, as we all know, a giant. We've had Chris and the Lomaxes and the Seegers have laid the foundations, as has everyone in this association, for knowing and understanding and studying this fabulous music, which today is a global uh, inspiration. And it all comes out of these small worlds like the Mississippi Delta and this powerful sense of place that is so important. And Richard Haxton, a gifted songwriter and poet who's here today, grew up in, Clark in Greenville, and his work is all deeply rooted in this music as well. Well, it's an honor to be here, and uh, I just have to say, walking through the book display room, I would like every book in there to somehow carry that back to Chapel Hill and put that, in. I'm sure we have a lot of them, but to see what all of you are doing, it's so powerful, and uh, we were talking with T-Bone Burnett. I took T-Bone your program and he was blown away by it. He knows many of the people who are on the program and he's carrying this music to uh, a whole new level, working with uh, Amazon and with all of the, the new technologies, but also saying that we've got to go back to tubes and to vinyl and to the old basics. And uh, everything is up for grabs, but the old, true, honest sort of foundation of music, which Chris and others recorded, Chris was always there ahead of me. Uh, when I interviewed Wade Walton, he said, I remember when Paul Oliver and Chris were here, and he told me about all of that, and then I interviewed and recorded Fred McDowell. Chris had been there ahead of me, as had the Lomaxes. So we're all part of a tradition, and it's really an honor to be in the presence of each of you, and especially of you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.